Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 24 this morning. We're going to look at verses 13 through 35. And I, I want you to um, take notes in this particular passage of Scripture because this is the only time that this story is told to us in the Gospels. Uh, a story that as I studied this week it was mesmerizing, and I, I, mean, I know I've read through it, but not really taking notice to all the events that happened. A conversation between two of Jesus' really unknown disciples and Jesus after his resurrection. See, we have, before this morning, had vivid, vivid messages about how we are to live our life based on what Scripture tells us. We have studied last month the book of Ephesians, and this month we're, we're studying this idea of what Jesus does for us. And we just sang a song that spells out what Jesus has done for us on the cross, and we're grateful for that. Last week we, we talked about this idea that Jesus reveal that Jesus restores himself, restores us to himself. Today we're going to talk about this idea of Jesus opening our eyes. He opens our eyes. So I believe the messages that have been preached the past couple weeks, there, there's not a mistake. I'll give you kind of an idea of how this works. You know, as pastors, we sit together, we put together kind of a, a, a sermon menu for months out based on what we think the flock, you and us, need to hear and need to understand. It was a mistake that last week we were talking about Colossians 3 and this idea of putting on compassion, kindness, patience, gentleness based on, see, right now in our lives we need to encounter Jesus, don't we, in every aspect of our life. So our message this morning, I want you to be thinking about this, things in your life, things that are happening around us in our world. When we think life is hopeless, Remember, we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Well, if you're here today, and you're one of those individuals, there's hope no matter what circumstance you're in. So this story brings us to the empty tomb. Jesus is risen. Amen? But let me tell you, these two disciples weren't hooping and hollering when they seen the empty tomb. See, the, the resurrection was something that was confusing to individuals, and it's confusing even to people today. If you ever have a conversation with someone, yeah, you know, I, I believe you're Christian, I, I believe Jesus, I believe all this stuff, but man, that resurrection, eh, I, can't, I can't wrap my head around that, so you know what, I'm just going to discount it. So yeah, Jesus was a good person, I get it, but yeah, the resurrection didn't happen. Well, think about it for a minute. Humanly speaking, it is impossible, isn't it? People just don't rise from the dead. But when God is in the factor, that changes everything. Anything and everything is possible with God. For instance, let's think about just some, some, some other um, stories or examples in the Bible. We think of Gabriel coming to Virgin Mary saying, hey, you're going to have a baby. Okay, humanly impossible, but it was God. You think of Elijah calling down fire from heaven to show that he was the true God to defeat the, the prophets of Baal. Fire coming down from heaven on a man's command? How do you tell that story? It's because it's God. Right? How about the hailstones in Joshua chapter 10 that were coming down from heaven and were just hitting the enemies of Israel and killing the enemy in the middle of battle? Just coincidence? But God. But God. And we, think we, we, we talked last week during our communion. We read a passage in Luke when the sky turned dark after Jesus gave up his spirit. Spirit and over the land for three hours, the, the, the sky was dark, it was pitch dark. Try to explain that away, humanly speaking. It's impossible only with God, though. Anything can happen. See, this goes beyond human reasoning, but God defies all odds. See, that's what He does. Throughout the pages of Scripture, and as we will see in this story, when prophecy, because the resurrection of Jesus, 
Jesus prophesied, the prophets prophesied. Those things came to pass, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. When we read those things, that should bolster and boost our faith, shouldn't it? Right? It should. When we read, it's like, wow, and it came to pass. Wow, our God is amazing. We serve a true and, and holy God. J.B. Payne is a scholar and theologian. He, he counted 574 prophecies in the Old Testament. That's a, lot to, that's, that's a lot to count. And 300 of those prophecies were fulfilled in the New Testament by Jesus himself. Think about the upper room discourse. Jesus sat around, broke bread, talked about his death. He prophesied three things. Remember what they were? Prophesied his death. They prophesied the betrayal of Judas and prophesied Peter denying him. And within 24 hours, those prophecies came to fruition. Coincidence? No, Jesus is God. I think you see three credentials of, of, of Jesus having here in, when we talk about our faith, our Christian faith. Jesus' impact in history. He is the most inf influential person in history. You can Google that. He will come up as that. People may not believe him, but they know he existed. He was a person. He was the most influential person in history. Guess what? Other faiths don't have that, do they? Number two, his physical bodily resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, it is told that he was seen by 500 people after his resurrection. It's, it's scripture. It's truth. It's what we read. And, and lastly, fulfill prophecy. Fulfill prophecy. Out of 574 the, the pro, pro, pro prophecies that are in the Old Testament so far, Jesus fulfilled 300 of those already done, signed, sealed, delivered. You know, in the world of religion, there's 25 sacred books that people view as holy. We know this is, of course, the truth. Amen? There's no other book that's more sacred than the Word of God because it comes from the very true and living God. But there's 25 sacred books that are out there that many followers follow. There's two things that they're, they're missing. Do you know what they are? They're missing a living leader. Yay? They're missing a living founder. Our Savior's alive and well, isn't he? And number two, in any of those 25 sacred writings, you will not see fulfilled prophecy. What's that say about our God? There was a song in the 90s written by a, a female artist, Nicole C. Mullins. She wrote this song, I Know My Redeemer Lives. I can't believe I'm actually saying that's an old song now um, because I thought it was a contemporary song. Well, it was at the time in the 90s. Um, but there's this song that says, I Know My Redeemer Lives. And she goes in the chorus. And I remember I used to drive to work and listen to that. And there, on the, the, the chorus, she would belt out, I know my Redeemer lives because I talked to him this morning. We have a living God that we serve, and he is alive and well. So when we look at this text this morning, this is the problem with these two disciples. They don't remember what God said in the prophets about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's look at verse 13 this morning. Start at verse 13, Luke 24, verse 13. Again, mark this passage up because it's the one and only story given about these two guys and this encounter with Jesus in the Gospels. <clears throat> Verse 13, that very day two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So there's one thing I want you to understand as we read this story, you understand that Jesus is talking to them, but they don't know it's Jesus. And we'll, we'll, we'll fill you in on why. So these two men just experienced, what they experienced, the crucifixion, the death, the burial of Jesus in Jerusalem. And they went to go see the tomb, as we'll find out. And the body is gone. So this is where they are at. So Jesus meets up with them. He's incognito. He's walking down. And he, hey, walks with them. See, Jesus closed their, God closed these men's eyes. Now, they weren't blind. They just didn't recognize Jesus for who he was. 
I believe the first reason why is God did not want them to recognize Jesus. See, in the original language, this conveys the sense that they were kept from recognizing who Jesus was. They were talking to a man, but they did not know it was Jesus. Jesus is not being cruel here. His gradual revelation of himself allows them to learn certain lessons about trusting God's promises. What a lesson for us in our world today. See, the disciples have been told about these very events many times before in the prophets. But they had not believed. We can read in Scripture, too, Jesus, uh, when he appeared to people after his resurrection, people didn't recognize him. We, we think of John chapter 20, Mary Magdalene. What did Mary Magdalene think Jesus was when she, he appeared to her? A gardener. Next chapter in John 21, we see the disciples coming in from a night of fishing off the Sea of Galilee. And they see this guy cooking fish on the shore. And they're like, hey guys, come on in, I got some fish cooking for you. And they're like, who's that? Well, we know it was Jesus. See, in God's time, they would see him for who he is and learn what God wants them to learn about the situation that they're in. Their lack of faith and believing. Let's continue in our story, verse 17. So Jesus, so Jesus is there, he, he's, he's hooking up with these guys, he's walking down the road with them, he says to them, what is the conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad, that word sad there in the Greek is discouraged. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered, and I'm going to say it in the way I think Cleopas said it to Jesus, are you the only visitor... To Jerusalem, who does not know the things that have happened these past days? I mean, come on, what, what, what rock are you sleeping under? I mean, understand what they just experienced, the crucifixion, the death of Jesus. This, was, this would have been all over social media. People would have known about this. And to have a guy say, hey, what are you guys talking about? And then Jesus said to them, <laughs> I love this, what things? What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and before all the people. Jesus was incognito. You remember the, that, 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 that show or the program on television, The Undercover Boss? You remember the CEO of a company would disguise himself and go to an a, a, a entry-level job within the company? And so they would work with someone, and they would find out a lot of things about the morale of the company. And you know, after they had the work day with the CEO, the person would get called up to the office, and they're like, why am I here? And they go in the CEO's office, and they're like, wait a minute, you're the guy, you're the girl, I, oh no. And they're thinking about what they just said to the CEO of the company, right? You remember that? Jesus here is incognito. And I love, I love, it, it's kind of the same idea. Hey, well, so what, what happened in Jerusalem? You don't understand? Well, what, what things? Tell me. And it's Jesus. Verse 22, moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they, had, they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. Underline that phrase. This is where they lacked in faith and did not listen to the prophets before. Underline that that is key there. So God did not want them to see Jesus at this time. I believe the second reason why their eyes were not open and God did not allow it was because God wanted to teach them a lesson. Because the events had happened was not what they expected. See, they had this idea of who Jesus was and what he had come to do and how he should do it. But when things did not turn out the way that they thought they should or how they were percept, perceived things, they dismissed this whole weekend as a failure, a misplaced hope and trust. I want you to look at the past test tense language there that was, that was given there in Luke 24. Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was... A prophet? He was? Okay, so you mean he, you, they don't think he's alive. They think he's done. Look, look at verse 21. But, he, but we had hoped? These guys are, are speaking to Jesus, and Jesus is find, finding a lot out about their faith or their lack of faith. See, what were the Jews expecting during this time? 
In this time of, 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 of Roman history, of Jewish history, what were they expecting? When they were listening to the prophets, these men and others were looking for Isaiah 9, Jesus. And what's that verse say? The verse we know, we usually state at Christmas time, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born. To us, to us a son is given. And this is where they are, we're looking for. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. They were waiting for King Victorious Jesus. The conquering king that was going to, and not, was going to take care of and, and take care of the government. And he was going to rule and reign. And take care of all the emperors of Rome. And Jesus was going to be that king, that hero. But what did they get? They got a lowly carpenter's son from Nazareth, who they just seen murdered, buried, and now the tomb is empty. Do you see where their hope has gone? Because this is what they were expecting. This is what the Jews expected, and even today, Jews are still looking for that Messiah, and they don't realize that he has already come. See, while God always has a plan, we are not always privy to the plan. These men were. They did not listen to the prophets. When things don't turn out like we expect, instead of giving up and admitting defeat or counting as a failure, we would be wise to see things differently. That maybe God is up to something new, something different, something we just can't understand or comprehend. The last reason I think God was teaching them a lesson not opening their eyes is because of their faith. They lacked faith. They heard reports of Jesus. The angel says that he's gone. He's out of the tomb. They had seen the empty tomb for themselves, but they did not believe. See, this supernatural working of God to raise Jesus from the dead was outside of human mindset or comprehension. Think about it. Have you ever a conversation about your faith and this idea that our faith is based on Jesus' resurrection? 1 Corinthians 15. If there is no resurrection, our faith is dead. You ever have that conversation? I, I believe in all the Christians, but the, the rising from the dead, man, I, I'm sorry. I just can't believe it. We need to be careful not to make the same mistake in our life and other areas of our life. To just discount what God has done simply because we can't understand it or explain it. Because what do we say at the beginning of our, our message? When God is involved, anything is possible. You can't discount anything. But Pastor Jesus, you don't know my circumstances. But God does. And God is God, and he can work in them. Just because they knew about Jesus does not mean that they knew Jesus. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of people in our world that know Jesus. There's many people in the world that could probably quote John 3.16. But do they know Jesus personally? They heard about him. They, they read about him. Again, he's one of the most influential people in history. But they could not recognize him if they saw him. Their eyes have not been open. Knowing about Jesus and knowing him as our Savior are two different things. Think about our life right now, what's going on in our world. We talked about it last week. Do we truly trust God and his plan? I know the Sunday school answer, yes, we do. But do you really? I must say that the issues that we dealt with this week in our country, I am glad I preached on Colossians 3 last week because I had to put on a lot of things because I was struggling. I was like Cleopas and his buddy walking away from the tomb, not questioning the resurrection, but questioning what God's plan is. I was walking away saying, there's no hope. Hell, handbasket, us. You know, that was my mind. But Jesus had to remind me, Jason, stop being a hypocrite. Because you stood from the pulpit and you said, listen, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And that's what we have to do. Jesus, you know what? He, I, I felt it in my spirit. And reading his word, listen, he's reminded me, listen, I am the king of kings. I, I, over, don't, I don't care who's president of where. I'm the king of kings. You know what, Jason? You need to look to the sky because I'm coming to claim my church. You know what, Jason? He didn't talk to me. I'm just, 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 I'm fine. <laughs> Pastor Frank would pull me off the stage if Jesus talked to me personally. Uh, <laughs> But in my spirit, just this idea that Jesus reminded me, hey, 
Revelation chapter 9, not Revelation chapter 19, and guess what? The church is going to come back with me, and we're going to take care of the armies of the world. And we're going to annihilate them, and I will rule and reign. And guess what, church? We will rule and reign with him here in his earthly kingdom for a thousand years. And this is what we're going through now won't even be a memory for us. So I had to walk through that this week for myself. Because I know what God's word says. We need to look future. Being with Jesus in his kingdom. In heaven with our savior. Because nothing else matters. And if you're here today and you're saying, well, how, how do I know if I get to heaven? And, oh, hey, we would love to introduce you to this Jesus who has changed our lives. And he will change your life too. When you put your faith and trust in him. So look what Jesus said to them as they told the story of why they were so upset and sad. Look at verse 25 and 26. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, circle and underline slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? Again, they still don't know who Jesus is. They don't know they're talking to Jesus here. That word, that phrase there, slow of heart, means this in the Greek. It means delayed in believing what one has heard. They heard the prophets of this day of resurrection. They knew from listening to the prophets this day was going to come. But they had, they were slow of heart to believe. Let me ask you a question. How are we delayed or slowed in our believing of our truth and scripture from God's word? See, we can point out the theology and doctrine we believe. Yep, I believe that. Yep, I believe that. I believe heaven. I believe in the doctrine of Christology and who God is and heaven. And oh, Yep, I know all these. Boom, great. We even love, love the passages of Scripture in Philippians chapter 4. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And we're at the, the verses that pump you up. Psalms 23. There's great passages of Scripture, great memories of, of our growing up and verses that used to encourage us. And that's great. But do we truly put our theology to practice in how we live? Do you truly believe the God that you believe in, the theology which, which you believe, can help you fix the issues in your life? Fix your marriages. Fix the relationship with your kids. Fix the relationship with your, with your family. Fix the issues that is in your community. To fix the problems you have at your job. And we walk through life with this idea, I, one pastor called it Dalmatian theology. You know what a Dalmatian is? The spotted dog? We have spotted theology. We like what we want to like. And we follow what we like in the Bible, and then that's it. Dalmatian theology. And the other things that are problems, the things, yeah, I really don't want to follow that. I know it says in the Bible, but you know, we don't follow. We don't want to be believers that, are, that believe in Dalmatian theology. Now, that's not a, if you Google that, that's not going to show up, okay? So please, that was a pastor's example. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. I'm going to be very, be very honest with you, church. I think every morning I wake up, I disobey this verse. Probably you do as well. Do we truly get up in the morning and say, I, God, in all my ways I'm going to acknowledge you? We probably don't, do we? We need to. Not just in the big things, but also in the little things. That's what these two men needed. They were not trusting in what the prophets had told about this day of resurrection. So many times in my life, I'm like Cleopas and his buddy here. I am just like them. Walking away from a situation saying, it's hopeless, it's done. And we forget what God's word has told us. Let's continue in our story. I love, this is going to be my favorite verse of the text. Verse 27, and here's why. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted. And that word there, interpreted, means to explain on a more extensive and formal level the meaning of something which is particularly obscure or difficult to comprehend. Jesus, beginning with Moses and the prophets, interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning him. Now again, remember in this conversation, they still don't know this guy is talking to them is the risen Lord. Would you give anything to sit in that conversation? These two men would graduate with a Ph.D. in Christology. They would. Can you imagine? And this conversation lasted hours. They had a theology class of the founder of Christianity. <laughs> Jesus Christ himself. And they didn't know who he was. 
first thing we see there's three things I want us to look at as we, as we get ready to close this morning that Jesus did to these men and he does to us every day first Jesus opens their eyes he opens our eyes this verse right here again I would love to be in that conversation while we don't know the specific passages that Jesus elaborated on it tells us he started with the law and he went to the prophets concerning everything about Jesus that's a lot of verses. That's a long conversation. But they needed to know this because their faith was lacking, not knowing. They may have heard about what the prophets say, but Jesus reminded them, this is who Jesus is. This is what the prophets said. Let's look at 16. Just going to run down through. It will be on the screen in front of you if you want to take a picture or take a note. There are 16 prophecies. Again, 300 prophecies Jesus fulfilled in the New Testament. Again, that should bolster our faith. He was born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14. He, number two, he was born in Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. He was born of the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49. He was in his Galilean ministry, it talked of in Isaiah 9, 1. He was a miracle worker in Isaiah 35. He entered Jerusalem on a donkey in Zechariah chapter 9. He was betrayed by a friend in Psalms 4. He was sold for 30 pieces of silver in Zechariah 11, as was prophesied. Wounded and bruised, it talks of in Isaiah 43. Sorry, sorry, Isaiah 53. His hands and feet were pierced in Psalms 22. Crucified with thieves, Isaiah 53. His garments were torn, Psalms 22. Bones not broken, Psalms 34. Side would be pierced, Zechariah 12. Number 15, buried in a rich man's tomb, Isaiah 53. And number 16, he rose from the dead or hidden. The prophecy of his resurrection, Psalms 16, 10. Do you know the likelihood of one person fulfilling just 16 of these prophecies? Okay, Andrew, you're a, you're a math guy. I'm going to throw it at you. One in ten to the 17th power. That just 16 prophecies being fulfilled by one man. So I'm not a math guy. Andrew knows that. That's why he's always helping me with that. No, anyway. So I'm going to show you a map of, 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 the, of the United States with uh, reddit out Texas. Here's an illustration to give you the understanding of how great our God is in the area of prophecies being fulfilled. If you would take a quarter and you would stack quarters up two feet high that covered the whole state of Texas. Now, Texas is a, is a big state. It takes days to drive through Texas. Two feet high quarters, the whole state of Texas. That's a lot of, that's a lot of quarters. And you picked one quarter in there. You marked it up saying, okay, you put it in the middle of that stack. The probability of one individual... Fulfilling 16 prophecies, it would be like if Andrew went and picked that quarter out of the middle of Texas and he said, here's the marked one. That's the probability of Jesus Christ himself fulfilling just 16 of these prophecies. Isn't that amazing? See, Isaiah, Zechariah, Daniel, we see a scripture here from Psalms, King David. In their times of where they lived, it was like they were shooting an arrow in time and space and they didn't know where the arrow would land and every single one of those prophets that shot that arrow they understand what they were doing they, God told them what to say in the word they shot that arrow and every single one of those arrows guess who landed on Jesus Christ isn't that amazing doesn't that bolster your faith doesn't that bolster your faith see these two men here they needed their faith encouraged. I love what Paul says in Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Outside of the word of Christ, there is no reliable witness of who Jesus is, is there? Right? No, right? I, I, well, I wasn't alive when Jesus was around. Bob, were you? I hope not. Right? No. What do we have? We have God's word. This is what we have. This testifies of who Jesus is. But not only does Jesus open their eyes, and he opens our eyes at times in our life to show, him who, show us who he is. Number two, now Jesus reveals himself to them. So this whole conversation, they're talking to this guy. They don't know it's Jesus. And Jesus is having a theology lesson with them. So here, look at verse 24, uh, verse 28. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if they were going further, but they urged him to say to strong, in him strongly saying, Stay with us, 
For it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went to stay with them. Why we, why we say that this, this particular, this conversation was long, it says from the time they started the morning, the day was spent. And seven miles is not that far to walk, right? You walk maybe, maybe an hour, two, hour, two, two miles an hour. Okay, you, you're going to get there in a couple hours. This was an all day, so you knew the conversation that Jesus had with them was long. So listen, Jesus, come, uh, man that we don't know who you are, come stay with us as we stay here the night. So here, he was at the table, verse 30, with them. He took bread, blessed, and broke it. Now look, this, this, is, this is great. And gave it to them. As soon as he blessed it and gave it to them, verse 31, and their eyes were open and they recognized him. And as soon as it happened, guess what? What's, it say? What's the text say? He vanished. That word vanished there in the Greek becomes invisible. He disappears from their sight. So you can kind of picture it. Say, God, Jesus prays. He looks at Jesus. Boom, he's gone. What in the world? We were talking to Jesus the whole time. See, at times in our lives, we are like these men, aren't we? We fail to remember who Jesus is in our life. We go through life forgetting the promises of God. They forgot about what prophets said about the day of resurrection, that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. And it's also interesting, the, int the intimacy around the fellowship of the table. How many times do we do that in our small groups? We gather, small groups, we share, we eat, we break bread, we pray, we, we're under God's word. And guess what happens in those times? Our eyes are open to see what Jesus is doing in our life. Maybe we learn from it from someone else that's going through something and we're there. And, we, and, we're, and Jesus reveals himself in different ways of things, how we go through things in life. And we're encouraged in that way. But lastly, what Jesus opens our eyes he reveals himself to us. And when that happens, and we say, man, I can't believe that. Do you see what God did in this situation? They're like, we were talking to Jesus. We were talking to Jesus. Look, look, at, look, at, what they, look at what they did here when, in verse 32. Jesus moves us to share how God reveals himself to us and how he opened our eyes. Look at verse 32. They said to each other, Jesus has just gone. They look at each other and they're like, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scripture, us to scripture? And they rose. So they got up, rose that hour, returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them together, gather, gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed. See, now they got it. And has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he, had, he was known to them in the breaking of bread. That, that phrase, their hearts burned, this reflects that they were excited with a renewed hope that they found Jesus. And did you get, get in the text here? Remember when they went in to eat, they were bunking down for the night? What does it say they did here? As soon as Jesus vanished, they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. They were walking down the road dark. In times of Jerusalem, there were thieves in the road looking for people to rob. They didn't care because they wanted, listen, Jesus is alive. They didn't care. They wanted to go tell the others of what they just encountered. And isn't that what should happen to us? When Jesus opens our eyes, when he reveals himself to us in the situations we're in, and maybe we have lost our faith for some time, or we're, we're at a, part, a, a certain part in our life where we're struggling, and we have to look in God's word, and God's word shows us, hey, I'm here to encourage you. This is what you need to do. Hey, this is why I did this. Hey, this is why you're going through this. And you see that, and you're like, man, God, I, I, I get it. And maybe he won't reveal that to you, but he's around you, and he wraps his arms around you, and you can feel the comfort of your Savior during those times that you know everything's going to be okay, that we want to tell others about this Jesus. Does that, what God does in our life, when we know the God of all ages, the sovereign king of all. We know that he has saved us. We know that he has a home in heaven for us. He know, we know that he protects us. He watches over us. No matter what we're going through, even though we don't like what we're, what's happening in our world, we know that God is on his throne. Does that 
give us a little spark to go share. These two men got up. We're going back to Jerusalem. We're going back. We're telling people we, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Who will you this week share with someone? Hey, this, this, this Jesus that I say is my Savior, let me tell you a little bit about him. I want to tell you what he did in my life. I want to tell you how he continues to watch over and care for us. Let me tell you about this Jesus. You may be dealing with individuals in your life, at work, at home, in your family, that are struggling. They do need Jesus. And because what he has done in your life, you're able to say, hey, let, 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 let me tell you how great this God is. Let me tell you this unbelievable Savior who saved me and what I have in him. Would that bolster you to share your faith? Hey, last I checked, our faith supersedes any other faith in the world. Why? Because our God lives. And the prophecies that are fulfilled in here, no other faith has. Share your faith. Tell people who Jesus is and what he's done for us. Especially in this crazy world in which we live, amen? We want people, all that matters in eternity is people. The people that have come to Christ, we want people to come to Christ. But you don't understand what I'm going through. I, 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 I probably don't, maybe I do. But guess what? God's told me what our future is. So let's see if we, as Christians, can bring as many people as we can into following Jesus because that's what's going to matter for eternity. People. Amen? Invest in people. Focus on Jesus. Focus on pouring into people even through this tumultuous times. As I preached last week, every morning put that Colossians 3 on. <laughs> put on those, the patience and the gentleness. Share Jesus. Look what he has done. These two men were different. Their faith was bolstered because of what they've seen. They seen Jesus. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this is. You know, we we love to love to introduce Jesus to you. Love to sit with you and just talk with you. And so please find us, um, reach out to us um, via email, a text after church. We love to love to talk to you. If you're here today and you're, you're a, a member of faith or a, a faithful attender of Faith Bible Church, and you just need someone to talk to or to encourage you we're here we're here throughout the week you guys have our numbers listen we want we, we're walking through this christian journey together and we can help each other um, through the, the times of struggle and trial and so we're here for you guys and we're here for each other um, and so um just remember that throughout your week so lord give us a great day thank you again for being your word and studying and revealing yourself to us through your holy scriptures in your precious name Let's all stand up and we'll sing the chorus of that song.